Hi, this is Rodrigo from Frame Freak Studio, and this is a Creative Hustler show. Uh, today's guest is Kirsten Winkelbauer. So, uh, pretty much, she's an amazing illustrator that uh, is currently working in trying to publish uh, books on her own. And she has a she's also a YouTuber. I, ha I have seen some of her videos, and they are amazing. And she has a lot of uh, experience into illustration and. I will highly recommend, obviously, in the end, we're going to talk uh, about the, her social media, but her illustrations are amazing and you should follow her. So welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so first of all, for the people who do not know about you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your history? How did you get started into art? Uh, pretty much what made you decide to choose this career? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was born and currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I started drawing when I was really, really young. I just always really liked it. And after about high school, I realized like you could go to school for art. I didn't realize when I was younger that that was a thing. So I went to art school and decided that I wanted to do freelancing. And I, I got really into illustration and I really liked the idea of working on personal projects and working on my own things. So that kind of gave me the idea to be a freelancer. And I've been doing freelance part-time and full-time for about five years now. Awesome. And when did you decide to go into freelance? Because I know uh, there is a lot of people out there who would like to have like the job security and all that. And right now, in, in, at this point in my life, I do know many people who are freelancers and have their own freedom business and side businesses and go pretty much traveling around the world. But I remember back then when I was just starting out that this idea sounded like really exciting, but at the same time, really scary. Yeah, it is really scary. And there are downsides to it. Like, obviously, you don't always have the job security. Like, I pay for my own insurance. I don't have benefits. But I really like the aspect of getting to pick what I work on. Like I get to pick what jobs I take. And when I do um, personal gigs, like personal projects, or I sell at conventions and at expos, I get to decide what I make. Like I get to decide my schedule. And having that freedom was really, really appealing to me. Um, I have worked for companies before. I might work for companies again in the future. But when I'm fully self-employed, I do feel like I'm more creative. And I tend to work on more of the stuff that I really enjoy. And that's a really big win for me. And I see right now that you are like in an office. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, uh, are you paying like a co-working space or? So I'm actually currently an artist in residence at a company called Redbubble and it's a paid residency program. And it's a, it's run by the company in order to help artists support their career and to kind of progress in their career. So I was able to get into this residency and my work here is purely personal. I work on a personal project here and I get to use their office space as part of it. So I'm able to come here and work. And so I'm almost done with that contract. I will be done with that contract next month. But it did give me a nice place to work for nine months, which was cool. <laughs> nice. Uh, this is some uh, one of the things that always amazed me of interviewing people and, and pretty much doing, doing this series is that the amazing opportunities that are out there. And wow. I think that it is really hard. Uh, for example, I have a couple of friends who I just been talking to them and they are in this kind of job that they don't like pretty much. And maybe their bosses are uh, a, a bit crappy to them and are really strict. And, and they are really af uh, afraid because on one side, like they don't like the, their job too much. And on the other side, like they're afraid because uh, they are locked out there. They are not, being aware of all these opportunities because if you told like anybody in the street like hey like you can get hired to work on your own project and still you will have an amazing office uh most people will not believe it but uh yeah. we are having this interview right now in yeah here, right? so yeah no that's true i think a lot of people don't realize that there are other opportunities out there because most people think that if you're going to be an artist full time, you have to work for a company or you have to have an office job. And that is definitely an option for people. But there are a lot of residency programs out there, paid internship programs. Um, we're through a company that does a lot of work with artists, but a lot of schools do stuff like that. There's plenty of tech companies that offer similar programs if you start to look for them. Also, well, I, I see that your Insta your Instagram game is like really on point. You have a lot of followers. Also, uh, your YouTube channel, like, 
well, so some YouTubers uh, will say, oh, yeah, I'm not that famous, but you have thousands of subscribers as well. <laughs> uh, I see that you have your Patreon. Uh, what kind of opportunities uh, have all these technologies allow you to, to pretty much use? What kind of opportunities have you explored? Uh, pretty much how, how, uh, how was your experience using all these tools? I think, um, I feel really lucky that we live in an age when we have all of these opportunities because it definitely allows you to reach your audience directly a lot faster. Like you can just put your artwork out there and build your own audience, which you used to not be able to do. And I really like that there are a lot of options for artists out there, but I also feel like social media is really kind of scary because you get really caught up in having those numbers and having those followers and you start to focus on that a little too much and not so much on your artwork. So I think it's a really good tool. I think it's gotten me, you know, a lot of commission work, a lot of contract work, but you have to be really careful not to get so focused on the numbers that you don't do what you want to be doing, you know? Yeah, there is definitely a trap that can happen. Uh, I, I, I wasn't like that cut out in social media before, mm -hmm. and when we started working, when we started doing uh, this business, like we use Facebook chat to pretty much communicate through all the projects, and that ended up becoming a decision that I, that I later regretted yeah. <laughs> because there was so uh, so many things to to get distracted. <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, pretty much when you see other artists trying to follow like kind of a similar path what you have uh, and what you have done, uh, do you see any mistakes that they are making that they are maybe not aware that they are making? And, and if so, what are they? Yeah, I think that does come back to worrying about the follower count. And I do understand that having a lot of followers usually is a sign that a lot of people like your art and could lead to a lot of really good opportunities. But if you only care about the number, that's something people tend to like get obsessed about. And you have to think about like, just because you have those numbers, what does that mean? Does it mean people are buying your art or does it mean, you know, people just want to keep seeing stuff that you're posting for free and don't necessarily become clients? So I feel like people get so wrapped up in being like popular on social media that they lose sight of what their long-term goals are. Because for example, on my Instagram, um, I used to do daily drawings. I did a new drawing every single day for five years. And that's how I got some of my following. And it was great because I did get jobs from it, but it wasn't fun anymore. It was, oh, I have to do a new drawing today, even if I didn't feel like it, even if I wasn't creative. And I realized I was doing it for the wrong reasons. And so you really just need to make sure when you're building your audience and you're growing your brand, don't lose track of why you want to have that business to begin with. So I think that's something that people don't always think about. Yeah, that, that is definitely true. Uh, I have seen friends who have, an amazing talent on drawing uh, fan pages, uh, Instagram accounts, things like that. Uh, but for example, I, I know a friend who has been able to create these, these accounts who have like uh, 300,000 followers, but when he tried to uh, sell something through it and he tried to make something out of it, like nobody was buying. Yeah. No, nobody was buying. And on the other hand, I have uh, friends who have maybe like a, a thousand followers or less but every time that they push something like they get a lot of sales so exactly yeah it. so the numbers don't always necessarily mean you're doing full-time sales so knowing what kinds of followers you want to have and the types of people you want to interact with are i think much more important to think about yeah there is this article uh from kevin kelly called uh 1000 true fans <laughs> and he pretty much talks about that if you're an artist, if you want to live through uh, pretty much your art, uh, whatever it is, music, uh, illustration, animation, mm -hmm. uh, you only have to get like 1,000 true fans. But uh, I think this article as well has kind of been misunderstood because many people are going like, oh, just get a thousand likes. No, 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 he was talking like true fans, like people who, if you say, hey, I'm uh, going to this city uh, to talk about something or do a workshop or something like that, they will travel for hours you see to it, see yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, that's completely different. And I totally agree with that. I think that's really true because I think, 
an example that most people can relate to is when you're you have a good following on one social media platform like say Instagram and then you try to jump to Patreon or YouTube a very very small percentage comes with you and that's when you start to see that like it doesn't mean that aren't your fans but you start to see like oh so you like me on one social media platform but it's a little harder to get people to follow you to a new one and it's just really interesting in that way because um, I'm obviously trying to grow myself on other platforms and it's basically like starting over and that's always been like a really interesting thing to me. Nice. Uh, when you send us uh, you, your information, you talk about that you're trying to jump more into personal uh, mm -hmm. work, uh, trying to do books on your own, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. You're talking about a book that you want to publish uh, through Amazon. Uh, first, uh, I want to ask you like, how are you finding that experience? Because we are at a, a similar point right now as well. Uh, we have been doing a lot of commercial work because it pays, it pays good, <laughs> but, and we have to pay the bills. But uh, we want to transition more to the uh, more creative work as well. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about your experience on that. And also then after, uh, if you can talk to us about, more about the book that you want to publish. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, I made the decision to switch more to personal work after doing this residency program that I'm in because it gave me a little freedom to work on my own stuff. I got to take a break from as much client work. And when I did that, I realized I was just taking on work to pay the bills, not stuff I necessarily wanted to do. And I realized how burned out I was getting. I was exhausted. I didn't feel creative. I didn't want to work on any of the projects I had. So I realized... I needed to kind of transition back to personal projects in order to do stuff that I actually wanted to do or I was just going to be completely burned out by the time I was 30. So it's been, it's not always easy. I will fully admit it's not always easy. I will still take on like emergency commissions when I have like an expense I need to take care of. But um, I definitely feel like I since have devoted more time to that, I'm suddenly more creative. I have all these ideas for things that I haven't had ideas for in forever, and I feel more motivated to work on stuff. And that has been much more rewarding and gratifying than I thought it was gonna be. And I totally understand that some people don't have the luxury of working on personal projects all the time, or they don't have the luxury of being able to work on them at all because you have to pay bills, and I get that. But I do think setting a goal for yourself and like a timeline for yourself for when you want to be able to start working on personal projects is really important or you're just going to put it off forever. Yeah, definitely. And can you talk us a little bit more about the book that you want to publish? Yeah, so um, I was reached out to by an author who had written a children's story book and she had brought me on to be an illustrator and she decided that she wanted to do self-publishing. So she's doing it through Amazon Direct Publishing and we are working out the contract right now in terms of number of illustrations, but we started to work out the style. We've done some sample illustrations and we're hoping to get that completed this year, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah, she's going to be doing it through Amazon, which I think is amazing. Like that wasn't a thing people had 10 years ago where you could just direct publish and then use your own social media to just push your own book. Like she doesn't have to get picked up by a publisher. And that's like crazy to me because you used to not be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, actually uh, I'm very close to that system because uh, one of the people that I follow the most, uh, an entrepreneur called Tim Ferriss was <laughs> the one who, who was pretty much advising Amazon on how to create that. Yeah. And the first book that they published through that system was his book uh, called The For Our Chef. And it's funny because, for me, it is funny because that book became like the most banned book <laughs> in, in the history because Barnes and Noble and all these publishing houses were uh, selling this book into their stores because they were so angry that uh, they knew that they knew at that point that okay, the system exists, and at some point in the future, uh, this is the one that is going to uh, get us to bankruptcy. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, we have now that system, so it's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of, of uh, pretty much publishing your book, uh, in this case, pretty much you have to uh, trust your own marketing because. One of the jobs that publishing houses had that was that they will help you out to market this yeah. book. Now that you have to use your, your pretty much your following in order to promote it. Yeah. Uh, are you good with social media strategies? Uh, have you worked uh, similar projects before? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely getting better at it. When I first started trying to market myself on social media, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but over the years, the nice thing about social media is it allows you to interact with your followers one on one. And so you can get a better feel for what people want and what's interesting. So, you know, like whether or not the project you're working on is going to interest them. And on top of that, like we have things like the um, questions in the polls on Instagram where you can even ask, like, if I posted this, would you guys be interested? If I posted a link to this, would you be interested? So you can get a feel for how interested your audience is even before you publish and you can post things leading up to it to kind of generate interest in advance. And that's really nice because you can control that and you can post the content that you want. So it is a learning curve for sure to figure out the best way to market yourself. But over the years, I feel like I've gotten a lot better at being able to do it, which is great. Yeah, that that is something uh, really true as well. I have a friend uh, who pretty much he sells products online and he has his following and pretty much created a, a fan page of motivational things and he sells mugs and t-shirts uh -huh. and things like that and when what he does is that when he wants to try a new product to see how it will do uh he creates like a very simple play page uh offering the pro the product and see if, and pretty much promote it to his page and now if people want to try to buy it it will appear a message that says that uh they are out of stock right now but that they can input their email uh, so they can get notified once he has a stock again. And, and, and that is a lie, pretty much. He, does, he hasn't uh, produced anything yet. But he sees how many people have bought the item. Yeah. And if the numbers match, then pretty much he, he makes it. And now he has, like, the email list of all the people who wanted to buy. So, yeah, uh, that's <laughs> yeah, that is something that he does. Uh, you mentioned as well that you were getting, like, overworked as well and, and, and kind of frustrated when not doing your own work. So yeah. I want to ask you, when you feel like really overwhelmed and stressed uh, uh, and unfocused, what, do you have something that you do to get back to your center and, and keep producing amazing work? Yeah, um, this has been one of those things I've struggled with a lot over the past couple of years and I'm still learning what works best for me. But what I have found, like when I'm super overwhelmed and stressed out, the first thing to do is just stop what I'm doing because nothing makes it more frustrating and harder to work well than just trying to force yourself through it. And I feel like a lot of people feel like they need to just work through it, to like just push through it and get this job done. But we're more effective when we're well rested, when our brain has a second to catch up, you know, when we're taking care of ourselves. So the first thing I do now is I just stop and walk away from what I'm doing for 10 minutes just to collect my thoughts. And even that 10 minutes like resets your brain and then you can kind of readdress what you're doing. And I've also found that having a really good sense of like a to-do list for the day, like learning how to prioritize and how to not overwhelm yourself in a given day is super important, especially when you're self-employed, because it's super easy to be like, oh, I'm gonna do 17 things today, and that makes no sense, and there's no one there to stop you from saying that. So you have to understand your limits and know, like, here's the top three things I need to get done today, and just do one thing at a time. And you end up being more productive, because once you get a few things done, it kind of takes off on its own. But you really need to kind of start small and like let yourself be realistic about stuff. Yeah. You know, it's funny, but doing this question, like many people have told me exactly that, like to stop and rest yeah. and to do lists. And I even have this thing here, the, uh, my productivity planner. Yeah. And pretty much what it does is that I, I can only write like five tasks at, at most, and this will be like the most important the most thing important. in the day. And, 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 and it sounds cliche, but it's true. And, and, and and it could sound really simple, but when I go out and ask, like most people are not doing that. Like again, yeah. when they, as you say, when they get uh, frustrated, like they just want to jump more into the work. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 relax, relax. <laughs> Sleep yeah. a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's really normal because I feel like one of the problems with um, the art industry and especially with the freelance art industry is there's this idea that you have to like hustle nonstop. And I'm not saying like you shouldn't work hard. And I, I do know if you're trying to run your own business, there is a lot of working nights and weekends. It's part of the job, but it's almost like normalized and like glorified. Like you have to work nonstop. Like you get up at five and you go to bed at one in the morning and people think like, I have to be working nonstop or I'm not working hard enough. And that doesn't make 
most people a productive worker. Like you end up getting more done if you're realistic about what you can do in a day. And then ultimately you progress faster when you do that. Yeah, and especially now we have a lot of tools that can help us uh, yeah. get things done in, in an easier way. So for example, there is this thing that I use called Sapier. And mm -hmm. what it does is that pretty much it allows you to join different applications even if they are not from the same company mm -hmm. so let's say for example in my website i have uh where i'm selling our animations i have a, a form but this form is is not a simple form it is from active campaign a software called active campaign so that what it does is that when uh somebody uh fills the form they immediately get get an automated email but with sapier what i do is that i I take all the information from that form and mm -hmm. pretty much uh, if I need this information in other places, so for example, I use zero for accounting and if I need uh, the information uh, of the client for the billing mm -hmm. for billing purposes, I can grab the information from the form and put it as a new contact there. Oh, cool. Now, this usually takes about maybe three to five minutes for me to do manually every day, but if you start like uh, let's say you get eight clients in in one week. Now mm -hmm. you have to be doing this for each client and that's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. And then yeah. there is also a distraction if you are doing something else. Mm -hmm. So at the end, if you start uh, summing all these type of tasks that are very simple then that you have to do every day and now you can use this software to pretty much set it sure. automated. Yeah. Like, you, you don't have to worry about it ever again, and this and yeah. st you still get it done. So that is important as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think um, this is something that like everyone says this in art school, and it's totally true. Like, work smarter, not harder. Like, if you can figure out a way to streamline stuff, like, there's always going to be something that's not fun or something that's difficult. But if you can figure out a way that you don't have to waste time redoing things, and you can do stuff once and have it be done. The more you can do that, the easier it is to like streamline your workflow. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, talking pretty much about these new kind of thinkings, has there been a new habit, a new mindset or, re or belief or behavior that you have acquired in the last five years that has improved a lot on your life uh, as a professional, as an artist or in general? Yeah, um, a big thing, and this was a really big thing for me, was taking better care of my health, both physically and mentally, because like I said, it's really easy for people to glorify this idea that if you want to hustle, you have to work nonstop and like always have stuff on your plate and basically like glorifying this very stressful life. And I was doing that for like a really long time. And even now, like if I have a really big deadline, it still happens, but I had to kind of realize that it was that lifestyle was having a really negative effect on my health and on my life. Like it was hurting me like physically, like I was having stomach problems. My drawing hand started getting really fatigued and I was also just stressed out all the time. I was tired all of the time and learning that you can't be successful if you're not taking care of yourself. It seems super simple, but we tend to put our health on the back burner because we want to succeed. And it's become a very normal thing for people. So realizing like my everyday behaviors, things that are just like, don't stay up past 11 o'clock at night, like drink water every day. Don't, I now limit myself to two cups of coffee. I used to drink like seven cups of coffee a day. So just little things like that, where you realize you're improving your health. Like I'm making sure I'm walking every day because I'm at a desk most of the time. Little things like that have improved my physical health and it's improved my mental health. Like I'm less stressed out. I'm less negative about stuff. And that has been such a life changing thing for me. Yeah. Uh, that is a, definitely a big thing. And it's hard to get because when you're young, like you can do a lot of crazy stuff and not feel it. Like I used to, to be able to be awake for three days in a row yeah. and still be functioning. Now, like I, if I stay awake from one day to another, like mm -hmm. the next day I'm, I'm completely in, in zombie state. Like yeah. I cannot think well, I, I barely can see. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things going wrong there. Yeah. And so, but, and that's true. Yeah, that's totally true because you don't, 
you sometimes think like in college, I used to pull all nighters all the time in college. And then when I switch back to freelance, I'm like, it's okay that my schedule's busy. I can just pull an all nighter. And the first time I pulled an all nighter as like a 20 something, I was like, Oh my God, like I need to sleep for three days. Like I couldn't, it was awful. So I, I don't do all nighters anymore. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, uh, a warning for everybody who is young listening to us. Once you have 25, uh, everything starts coming down. Like, yeah. take care of your health. <laughs> That's when it happens when I turn 25. So, yeah, take care of yourself when you're young. <laughs> so, uh, how, how you ever had like a something that felt like a failure or an apparent failure that has set you up for uh, a lot of success or something really important and good happening to you in the future? You know, it's interesting. Like I, I actually recently did a video on this. Um, I think people look at failure as like a really negative thing. So a lot of times people think like, cause they failed, they messed up and it's just like a bad thing that happened. But I think in general, um, failures are really just roadblocks that teach us how to work around things that have happened and kind of teach us how to move on and do better the next time. And so failures, failures in and of themselves have been really good for me because they do teach you kind of how to have a thicker skin and how to do better and how to kind of improve yourself. So for example, the residency program that I'm in right now, um, I didn't get into it the first two times I applied. The first time I got rejected pretty much straight out. The second time I made it to like an interview portion, but I still didn't get picked. And so it took like three years before they contacted me and we actually got to this point. And when I initially got rejected, I figured it's cause like I'm not a good enough artist or like, you know, I'm just like not cut out for this. And then I realized it was like, you just need to improve your skills a little bit, do learn how to do a better application, learn how to do a better project proposal. And so that taught me how to like update my portfolio, how to propose things to jobs, like how to pitch things, how to apply for residencies. And so now if I ever want to apply for another residency, I feel much more confident because I learned what I did wrong from getting rejected the first two times. So a lot of times it's, it's not a failure. It's just a learning how to do it better next time. Yeah. I think that it's really important. And like uh, to learn how to learn from this kind of things, yeah. because I see many people who get discouraged, like they try something and then get, they get rejected and that's it for them. Like yeah. they never try again. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> learn from this. Like uh, yeah. you can ask, like you can literally call them and ask like, hey, uh, I would like to learn. I would like to improve. Uh, can you tell me what I what are the reasons why did you didn't choose me so I can yeah. improve on this application? So, yeah. But that, that, that is something that most people don't do, I think. Mm -hmm. Because it's hard, especially when it's something really creative. I feel like we our art is very personal to us. And when we pitch personal projects or we pitch like our own personal artwork and it gets rejected, like that hurts. It's kind of like, oh my God, I worked so hard on that. How do you not like it? And it's really easy to think it's because your work isn't good and it, that's not necessarily it. It could just be, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right employer. It just wasn't the right situation. And I think it is something you have to, rejection is a big part of the art industry and knowing that it's not a personal thing against your art makes you have to think about it that way. So you can look at it as a learning experience, not as like a, a thing to make you not want to do it anymore. Yeah, uh, I think I was very lucky on this kind of mindset in the beginning because uh, there were a lot of things that I had uh, pretty much installed in my brain without realizing it from the very early stage. So I didn't, uh, failure didn't scare me a lot. Like, for example, uh, with my friends uh, at a very early age, uh, we love this show called Jackass. And oh we would do. <laughs> and we will do this stuff like I still have a couple of recordings like in the very early days of phones having cameras and uh, yeah. the resolution is horrible and all that but we will go like hi I'm Rodrigo Flamenco welcome to Jackass and do something very, very stupid just for the fun of it and I still have scars from it but but sometimes uh, so what I love from Jackass was that some sometimes they had like a very stupid idea and they will just go do it and sometimes the result was amazing and sometimes it was just stupid but the, <laughs> we all laughed and and and, and that kind of thing uh, that kind of thinking was the same that i apply to many ideas in entrepreneurship it's like 
uh, and I, it's still funny for me because many people come to me and say, oh, but he's so smart. It's like, no, no, no. I, I, I'm a stupid enough to try things that most people will not try. <laughs> and like, you kind of have to risk a lot of stuff in order to keep moving forward. Like you have to, you have to have something go wrong or have something fail or have someone reject you. Like you have to, like, otherwise you don't know what that feels like. And if that, I don't know anyone who hasn't been rejected a million times or hasn't done something that other people are like, oh, you shouldn't try that. Like sometimes you got to do it. And a lot of times it ends up being good that you took that risk. So it's a really good mentality. Yeah. And also uh, I have a uh, uh, mentors who taught me like really well that done was better than perfect. So that yeah. is something that also moved things forward. Yeah. Uh, I had a, 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 an experience with my first business that I put a lot of work into my, my website because I was offering web design back then. And I wanted, because I was offering web design, I wanted my website to look like really good. And I worked into the website for three months to look really good. And then I went to look for the clients and I got my first three clients and none of them watched my website. And I realized like, I could have gotten these guys like three months ago without doing anything. Yeah. And, and, and from there on, like I never went that crazy into perfectionist mode ever yeah. again. And even th with this business and these interviews, like for example, we started out without having a name, without uh, registering business, anything. Like we were just a group of, of freelancers working together. We started the interviews. And one year after, like a client comes and it's like, we really want to work with you, but you have to have like a corporate image. It's like, oh yeah, like it's been a year we should have. <laughs> <laughs> like like we, we went uh, beyond the line of what was acceptable with that. But at the same time, it's like, a proof that you can do a lot of things if you stop like overthinking and just do the thing. Yeah, right. and just do it. Yeah, because I do feel like something I've noticed, especially with like, I have friends who um, were either younger than me in college or are just starting to do freelance like much later. And they have this idea that like, I can't apply for this job or I can't try to do this because my portfolio isn't good enough or like my project isn't good enough for it yet. I'm like, well, you can still try like because you'll get something out of it. But so many people are scared to try new things because they think I'm not good enough for it. And a lot of times your expectations are so much higher for yourself than other people have them for you. So you could spend your entire life waiting to be perfect or waiting to feel like you're good enough. And that could never happen because I know like self-doubt is a huge thing. I never feel like 100% great about most things that I do, but clearly it works for the clients because I'm able to get regular work. So I'm like, you need to give yourself a break and just take a shot because if they say no, then you'll still be in the same place. Like you won't have that job. So what's the harm in trying it? Yeah, and this industry is like really, really good. Like for example, uh, again, like we didn't have a website, we didn't have a name, we didn't have anything mm -hmm. and yet they started like, uh, sending emails to people to interview because at the beginning we still did not only we didn't have anything to show for but we didn't knew anything like we are not from the US so we didn't know how the industry worked yeah. and it was like uh, we were like okay how can we learn like oh ask people who have done it so we start like uh, uh, pitching people and we got the first eight episodes of, of this interview show like that and without anything to show for and yeah. and and many of them were like uh, well, we got to Moore, we got Robert Kondo, they already had an Oscar by, back then, yeah. like we had the Steven Silver, and people were like coming to me, and it's like, how did you get these guys? And it's like, I just sent an email. Just I just sent yeah. a tweet. <laughs> exactly, that's such a good example. Like that's totally it, because the worst, and this is interesting, the worst someone can do is say no to you. And everyone thinks that's like terrible, like, oh God, they said no, but people say no to you all the time, and truly, it's not the end of the world if someone says no, and that is the worst that can happen. So just do it. Like, because if you hadn't asked, you wouldn't have had Robert Condo and Steven Silver on here. Like, you wouldn't have if you didn't just ask them. And look what happened. Like, yeah, pretty much. And and, <laughs> and, and again, like, as you say, like, people call, like, oh, but I'm not ready because I don't have this title or I don't have this qualification. It's like, I didn't finish <laughs> uh, 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 college. I, I don't have a title I'm from a third country. Uh, I have a, a huge accent and back in the day it was way worse. <laughs> Pretty much my camera was shitty. Uh, the microphone that I had was shitty. Uh, I had a lot of noise uh, around <laughs> the, the yeah. place where I was. Like everything was, everything that could go wrong with that uh, was wrong. <laughs> and, and still things came through and, and, and it's like, just try. 
<laughs> see what happens. Uh, and, and again, like you say, like people think that DC, I know, will be like devastating. And many of the time it's like, oh, no, but because I'm busy right now, but look for me <laughs> in one yeah. month, two months. And that's yeah. it. No, that's totally true. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on this topic, if, if you ever met a, a driven student who has a lot of talent and who wants to follow a similar path, uh, the, 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 well, the one that you have taken, and also uh, is about to enter the real world, what advice would you give that person and what advice should they ignore? I think... Oh man, there's so much out there. And I think everyone probably have a different answer to this, but I think when you're going to go into like the quote unquote real world of freelancing, it's really important to be realistic and to know what you're getting yourself into. Because I'll admit, like, I love what I do. I love being an artist. This is the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And for some reason, there's still this idea, this like really romanticized idea that being an artist is easy and that it's all fun. And that drives me crazy because no artist I know has ever said that. So I don't understand why people who aren't in this industry think it's easy. Like that drives me crazy because you really do need to know that especially if you're freelancing, like, yes, you have freedom to work on your own projects. You have control of your own creative creativity, but keep in mind, if you're running your own business, there are things like finding your own clients, doing your own emails and social media and marketing, doing your taxes as a self-employed person is the worst. It's terrible. Like I hate it. Thank God I have an accountant now. Like you have to be really realistic and know everything that goes along with it because it's not an easy ride you do give up certain things when you take the perk of having your own your own business. Like there are no benefits and in insurance and stuff like that. So understanding that it's gonna be really hard. And in the beginning, you're probably gonna take jobs you don't wanna take because you need the money. And knowing that if you work through it, I personally think it's totally worth it. I think it's been worth all of the struggles that I've gone through to get here, but I think if I'd had a better sense of how stressful this would be when I started, I would have approached it really differently. And I think you should really ignore people who, I don't know, like I'd, I think everyone's advice is valid in certain ways, but I think people who put too much focus on things like social media numbers or creating things just because other people like them, don't take that advice. Like don't stress about having the most followers. Don't stress about only creating stuff that people are going to like because the minute you only start creating content for other people, you stop creating it for yourself. And when you're not creating it for yourself, like it's just a job at that point. Like why, why even do that? Why not just go work at like a bank or something? Yeah, definitely. And onto that topic, uh, how was your journey into discovering like these business skills and integrating them? into <laughs> art because i know many people who are like really amazing artists but who cannot live from their art because they have zero business sense like yeah. zero strategies zero professional skills or work ethic mm -hmm. uh they are trying to take art as a hobby and they are mm -hmm. trying to make it as a professional thing mm -hmm. and there is this book called the spark and the grind uh that I think it really hits that point where you you have to have this yin yang kind of stuff. Like okay, like yes, all this part uh, that you have about art, like uh, your dreams, your emotions, and all these things, is good, is valid. But you also have to have this yeah. other kind of corporate thinking, <laughs> let's yeah. say, or business skills that have to match this thing, and yeah. you cannot uh, have one or the other. And especially mm -hmm. in creative industries, uh, we have seen. Uh, companies who have billions of dollars in, in their pockets like creating uh, games or movies that are uh, cash grabs and, uh, and, 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 and and it is horrible like you can really taste when something is being done just to get money yeah and it does and when it comes to the art world it doesn't feel quite right and yeah that's it doesn't have to it. yeah or there are also like these amazing uh, pieces of art that because they didn't have like the commercial skill set, in yeah, it, uh, they didn't got maybe uh, uh, known uh, worldwide, or or they didn't get uh, the reward that they deserve. So For I the think world there world is, world. A, yeah, I think there is a balance. Yeah. How did you went about pretty much discovering this other side? 
So I think that is something that a lot of, especially young artists think is I, I'm good at drawing like, you know, and there are plenty of talented young artists who are super talented and they think, oh, this automatically means money. I'm just going to put it for sale somewhere and someone will buy it. And I think understanding the business aspect, I think I was able to figure that out a little bit earlier because I, I actually, before I was, uh, full-time freelance. I did a lot of side jobs and part-time jobs. I worked in retail a lot. I did a lot of business stuff for people. And when you know how to sell stuff to people, it's transferable to whatever you're selling. Um, I used to work at kind of a higher end boutique and it wasn't on commission, but there was definitely like, they encouraged us to like sell stuff to people on the floor. So you had to know how to like grab someone's interest and explain how to sell stuff to them. And that has been particularly useful when I do like conventions, like comic conventions or like expos and stuff like that. I know how to get people to come into my booth. I know how to do a sale because I have had to do that before. And that was so much more valuable than I thought it was going to be like when I was in retail, but that that has been a big part of it. So I do think having some kind of history with selling stuff to people is valuable in and of itself. But also, um, I think just the acknowledgement that you need to focus a very big part of your time on social media and marketing. Like if you want to be someone who's selling your own work, you have to be comfortable sending out those emails and those phone calls, which was hard for me. I'm very, <laughs> I'm introverted and I have a lot of anxiety. So emails and phone calls are hard for me, but I had to get past that because that's, it's part of your networking and you have to know that you're going to have to reach out to tons and tons of people in order to get like a couple of people interested in you. And so I think that like realizing like just putting my art out there wasn't good enough. And I realized that really, really early on. So learning how to get people interested, it took some time, but it definitely grows on itself. Like the longer you're on social media, the more people you interact with, it gets a little bit easier. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, there is also this idea that uh, selling is kind of a sleazy or bad or things like that because we have this, uh, I don't know, this archetype of the sales guy who will say about anything just to get your money. <laughs> But I think there is also this lack of uh, understanding as well. I think we all have the experience where... Uh, we had to buy something that was really expensive. And when we bought it and use it or got it, we were really happy about getting it. Yeah. And I think that art is like, if the art is good, uh, art does that every time. Like, yeah. if the art is good, like you're happy of uh, pretty much for buying this. And, and yeah, in those cases, like if you have the skills to, uh, and your product is really well, like it's really mm -hmm. good, uh, then it is good that you combine those two skills because at the yeah. end people will be happy to have that from you. And if they are happy, they will come again like over yeah. and over. And that's the thing too. It's like, I, I don't want to make it sound like artists are out here like waving people down and like dragging them in to buy their stuff. It's really what we're trying to do is make it clear to people that this is art. Is, it's a thing that we make, but it's still a product. And if you enjoy it, if this makes you feel something, if you want to look at it all the time, realize that by paying for it, instead of just asking for it for free on like Instagram, you're allowing me to make money so that I can continue to make things for you. Like it's one of those things where people unfortunately don't always see art as a product that's worth money because they're like oh i love it and it makes me feel something but i can just look at it like why am i paying for it and it's like what you're paying for is the people to continue to create that for you to be able to live um and so i think a big part of the sales thing is not pushing clients too hard but getting the point across that they're asking for something that not everyone can do And all we want to be able to do as artists is to continue to create those things that make people feel something. But I mean, you can't pay rent with exposure. So it's still a business. Like we're still people who need to buy groceries. So I think getting clients to understand that is a big part of the sales pitch as well. Like know that you're supporting a person. This is not you buying something at Target or like at a big company. It's I'm a person who does my work in my office and you're supporting me as like an individual who's just trying to get by. Yeah, I think this is a point that is being understood more and more thanks to the internet. Yeah. And obviously the news uh, usually cover negative things. So when, but, but I think we can see it when, let's say, for example, there is a trailer of a movie people don't like. Uh, and you can see in YouTube that everybody goes like this, like this, like this, like, and they 
just don't go to see the movie uh, yeah. to pretty much uh, get the point across that, okay, this is not something we want to see. Like, uh, please don't do more of this stuff. <laughs> and, and, but, the, and usually that's what the news cover, but there is also a lot of cases where something amazing comes out and it, and everybody's like, bye, bye, bye. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody, go, and, and we have this interview with these guys uh, uh, from Team Cherry who created this game called Hollow Knight. Now the, the game costs only like $16, but it's one of the best games I play. And if you look for this game everywhere on, uh, online, like you will see that yeah. everybody loves this game and it's yeah. like really huge. And, mm -hmm. and and you can see like when you learn that these guys were only uh, four guys working in their basement, like one programmer, one animator, one musician, <laughs> and the marketer, and they they did this massive world. And something that I didn't knew when I when I interviewed them is that in order to kind of save on expenses, all the animations that they did, mm -hmm. they did it on Photoshop, not even in After Effects, <laughs> but just to save a little bit more money. And it's like, that's crazy! Like you animated Photoshop, like how do you even do that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 and people do see this kind of effort that they have put. Yeah. And pretty much everybody went out of their way to to buy this game and, and made it a huge success. And also all this other game, uh, Cuphead as well. Like you could see yeah. the passion in these guys and 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 yeah, like everybody went just like, okay, here's my money. Like keep doing more of like, this stuff yeah. as well. I, and I do think a lot of people really do want to support small businesses and want to support independent artists. Like I think they really do. I think it's just there is this overall mentality of forgetting that there are people behind the art. They just think it's a product. And so there's a little bit of um kind of getting people to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, and again, things like Kickstarter, Patreon yeah. uh, have helped a lot to 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 get that point across because yeah. I have seen like people who maybe are creating art in a way that uh, it's not something that they can easily sell as mm -hmm. a product, but they just open Patreon and open a place for, let's say, $1, $2, yeah. And it's like, hey, if you just want to support me, like here it is. And then there is a lot of people like yeah. uh, giving them not just the one dollar, two dollars, but giving them ten dollars each month, yeah. or twenty dollars each month. So uh, I, I think that kind of uh, thinking is starting to uh, be more present in the mind of the people. I think so, yeah. And social media has helped with that a lot because it gives you that opportunity to support the people you want without having to go through big businesses. Like you can just give to someone's Patreon, and it's not a lot of work for someone to do, but it counts like we notice that like we notice every single person who like gives money to us like we know that like it's and it's i don't know something about it's really rewarding like knowing that there's a personal connection to the people who buy your products definitely now i'm going to make you a really hard question uh, but many great <laughs> answers come from this I, I think you might have an idea of, <laughs> of which question it is but uh let's say you wake up tomorrow and nobody knows about you. Like you are in a different dimension. You have your house, you have all your, or your tools, uh, your knowledge, skills, but you don't have portfolio. The, nobody knows about you and you have $500 in your pocket. What do you do to get to this point uh, in your life, professionally speaking, as soon as possible? Truthfully, and I, this is really interesting. Um, my first instinct would be to put the $500 in savings because you always need to have some money saved up. Um, the first thing I would do is get a part-time job because if I've learned anything, it's that nothing makes you less creative and more stressed out than not knowing where your next paycheck comes from. And given my current living situation, I could make rent on a part-time job and knowing that I'm stable and can spend you know, three days a week at a part-time job, not worry about it, and then spend the rest of the week, four days a week, working on my own portfolio, I would be so much more motivated and so much more focused on getting that portfolio done well and building back my social media if I knew I was like financially secure somewhere else. And I feel like truthfully, like in real life, if I had done that earlier on, if I had like had a really stable part-time job and knew my rent was covered every month, I probably would have built out the portfolio I have now and the following I have now much faster because when you're hustling so hard that like you can't even focus, you're not going to be productive. So I would, I would seriously work at like a cafe for three days a week and then spend my free time 
building up that portfolio because I already have the skill set. So I just need to not have that pressure on myself. Definitely. I think you just made a great, great point. And this is something that I learned later on in life. Uh, there is this thing called the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And pretty much if you see creativity, like that is at the top. Mm -hmm. And and it says like, okay, if you want to be at the top creative position in your mind, like you have to have uh, security, home, like uh, yep. good relationships, uh, uh, yeah. all, your loving life uh, set up, uh, and then pretty much self-development, like all this kind of stuff, yeah. like you have to be set up really well. And if you have everything well, then, then that's when your uh, top creative mind comes out. And, yeah. and I think people, go all the other way. I have, I know people who have uh, quitted their jobs because they were like burning the boats and then they, exactly. they are going in their life mission. And then three months later, they are looking for jobs because- they... Exactly. So like, why would you not put yourself in a place where you can actually think and you can actually focus on what you want to focus on? Um, and if I can, I, I don't know. I think everyone's different. I've only ever lived in the Bay Area, but I'm figuring out a way to make this work in San Francisco, which is like the most expensive place in the United States to live. Like you can work four days at a cafe in like Minnesota and like work on your portfolio in the meantime too. Like you don't have to, you're not proving anything by burning the candle at both ends just to say, oh, but I draw full time. If you're stressed out, you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. You're not proving anything except that you're going to be exhausted in a year. You know, there's nothing wrong with part-time work. There's nothing wrong with being financially stable. There's nothing wrong with the art that you do being something you have to do on the side for a little while. Like there's no shame in that. And I wish people wouldn't be embarrassed to say like, because I have friends who went to art school and they're like, oh yeah, like I have to work at a store on the weekends to make ends meet. I'm like, so what? That means you're an adult who's making sure you have enough money to make rent. That's responsible. That's like what an adult is supposed to do. And I think there's this really negative connotation with people who can't do full-time freelance right away. They're like, oh, I'm not good at this. And it's like, no, the world is just really difficult and it's hard to be an adult and everything costs money. No one tells you that when you're young, you grow up and everything costs money. And you're just like, what? Like groceries are how expensive? So there's nothing wrong with having to supplement your income. Like there's no shame in that because as long as at the end of the day, you're drawing and you're creating the stuff that you care about, I feel like that's more important. Yeah, I think uh, our generation grew up with this message that, yeah, you can change the world. And, and yeah, you can, like, you can, yeah. you really can. But uh, also I think they went overhand like, on that message and they forgot <laughs> the part that you just mentioned, like, okay, yes, you can change the world, but also the world is like really, 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 really hard. And, and yeah. you're going to have to face things that you cannot even control exactly. and that are going to mess your day or, or your year even. <laughs> Exactly. And you have to take care of that as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I just artists in general, at least everyone I know, we're just trying to get by. We're trying to do the things we care about. Like that's why we that's why people do art because it's something that they enjoy and they have a passion about. So ultimately, that's what you should be focusing on, not like the notoriety or not like being able to say, like, I am, you know, lead art director at Pixar. Like that's great. If you are like that's amazing, but there's nothing wrong with you if that's not your situation, as long as you're doing what you care about. So I want people to realize like, yes, you can aim huge and a lot of people will get there, but like you can't get kicked out of your house while you're trying to do that. Like you still need to like take care of that as well. Yeah, uh, for example, in my country, there is this contest that they are giving money to people to make their own animation pilot, but oh. they have this idea that they will be able to do everything in eight months and mm -hmm. even selling the idea of animation is like and, and when i started in these interviews and starting to get more of the community uh i found i found out really quickly that it takes years <laughs> to get an idea approved and even if you are like at the top of the games for example uh fred seibert and gendy tartakovsky like uh, a, a incredible famous uh producer with an incredible famous directors that are at the top of the game they took 12 years to get samurai jack approved <laughs> it's like okay and you are thinking like you can do this in eight months like oh, no wow. no that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, so, uh, mm, that's some high expectations there but ooh. <laughs> yeah right. definitely so, is there any advice that you would like to give uh before we end this interview that 
you think is important that is not being talked enough in, in the community and also that we have, haven't mentioned into this interview yet? Um, I, I mean, I feel like we touched on this, but I do think just keep in the back of your mind, please take care of your health um, in art school. They tell you so much about how to prepare for the industry and how to learn to hear no and how to like prepare your portfolio. No one ever tells you like how bad it is for you to be working like 12 hours straight. Like I'm 28 and I already have fatigue in my drawing hand, which I'm going to have to do treatment for. And it's just like, no one ever talks about that, like how your body can be affected by overworking it. And so please make sure you're taking breaks, make sure you're drinking water every day. So many people just forget to drink water, which is crazy to me. Like make sure little things in your life are healthy. And I, I just want that to be like, you can't keep making art if you can't get out of bed in the morning. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. If something feels wrong, listen to your body. That's really important because yeah, art is kind of the number one thing on our mind, but you have to be functioning well to be able to do it. So just make sure you're taking care of everything in your life. Awesome. If people want to find you, where would be the best place to do so? So I do most of my posting on Instagram. You can find me at Instagram.com slash WinkleBB. I also post videos once a week on YouTube, also username WinkleBB. That's actually my username on everything. So if you're interested in pretty much any social media platform, I'm WinkleBB across the board. But I do post on um, Instagram, YouTube, and Patreon the most. Awesome. Thanks a lot for giving us your time and all your knowledge uh, for this episode. Uh, I really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. It was really, really fun. Thank you for having me. So this has been the last episode of the Creative Social Show. If you like it, please uh, click the like button below. And if you're seeing it from the website, uh, share it with your friends. Until next time.